Welcome to our last unit on cardiovascular system. So during this week's material, we will have a look of some common characteristics of the blood vessels and then move on to consider more specialized adaptation on different types of vessels. This is, I believe, a great way to start what we have been looking so far and will be looking in this chapter. As you might remember, we have already discussed about the blood, which was of course the transportation media of the cardiovascular system. And the heart, which was the pump driving this transportation media known as blood. In this chapter, we will focus on the blood vessels, and you can consider them as the tubing within which this transportation media known as blood is driven forward by the pump, which was of course our heart. So the blood vessels will be the focus of this unit. You can consider it as the delivery system, and we will consider a different adaptation of this tubing in the coming modules where we'll discuss about the lymphatic system. This delivery system that we will look at now starts and ends at the heart. But for now, let's consider a little bit why it might be important for you to know more about the blood vessels. And when preparing this video, I came up with many examples and there are many more that I have not yet listed. So we need to understand about the blood vessels in order to understand what happens in case of, for example, bleeding when we have a cut on this delivery system and now blood escapes from it. Or in case of bruising, where there is bleeding but it is under the skin, so that the blood does not really leave outside the body. Or one topic which is going to be very important for us is going to be when the blood pressure is outside normal values, either too high or low. And the final example that I listed here is various blockages. Made it be due to the cholesterol building up on the blood vessel walls or blood clots traveling into vasculature until they get stuck to the narrow vessels. And of course there could be many others. These were just some to highlight that it is really important for us to develop an understanding of this system if we wish to pursue understanding of many of its clinical adaptations. So, there are different types of blood vessels that we will be looking at this section. And it is typical that we discuss these following the direction of the blood flow. So, we would always start with arteries, which are the first vessels leaving the heart, carrying oxygen-rich blood. And of course, an exception to this would be the pulmonary circulation and the umbilical vessels of the fetus. But in general, arteries are in other cases always carrying oxygenated blood. And then we have capillaries. These are vessels with a small diameter and in close contact with the body tissues. So an exchange of gases, oxygen and carbon dioxide, nutrients and waste products and whatnot like hormones and so on is easy and efficient here. And then, when this has taken place, the blood returns back to the heart via veins. These carry blood that is typically deoxygenated. So, these vessels really make a loop, but as they would say in Home Shopping Channel, wait, that's not all. We will also have two other types of vessels that we need to know. And arterioles are, just to put it simply, smaller versions of arteries. They are in between the arteries and capillaries. So not quite arteries, but not quite capillaries, but something in between these. And same goes for the venules. They are larger than capillaries, but smaller than veins. So this looks now like a great list, I would say. Let's look at the general structure of a blood vessel wall here. And while the blood vessels vary depending on what they are from our previous list, they all generally tend to have most of these layers. And there are three layers that I want to highlight. 
and they are known as tunicas. And here they are. Tunica intima, tunica media, and tunica externa. The last one is sometimes known also as tunica adventitia. I think that this was more common at least in the UK where I first learned this. So just do not get too surprised if you see tunica externa and adventitia being used interchangeably. We will start our study of these layers from the first, the most innermost layer. This is known as tunica intima. One way to remember its location as the one that is closest to the lumen, this is the center of the vessel, is to think that tunica intima is in an intimate contact with the blood inside the wall, vessel of all these layers. Tunica intima's walls are made of simple squamous epithelia. Do you remember what this tissue type looked like? If not, I will add a link to a video on these tissue types at the end of this video. But if you do, well, here is a nice diagram of a cross-section of these tissue type cells. So Tunica intima's innermost layer is made of these smooth, flattened disks of a single layer. And there is a reason for it. This complements the tunica's function to protect and offer an easy passage of materials through this layer. Let's look at the next layer. Tunica media is the middle layer. Its wall is made of largely of smooth muscle and elastin. This tells us about its function too. Smooth muscle layer around the blood vessels allows us to control the vessel diameter through contracting or dilating. And of course, these were known as vasoconstriction, where the vessel diameter decreases as the smooth muscle layers constrict around it. And vasodilation, where the diameter increases. I do also want to mention that this is the thickest layer of these. And then, let's move our focus onto the tunica externa, also sometimes known as tunica adventitia. So this layer is made of largely connective tissue and its function is to support by reinforcing the walls and anchoring the vessel to its site. We find that a lot of nerves and even lymphatic vessels run in this layer. And while it's quite logical that these cells in tunica intima and media were able to get nutrients and oxygen from the blood inside the vessel, this can be a little more difficult for tunica externa, as now the distance from the lumen of the vessel has grown longer. So what do we do in case of a large vessel that we may have? Smaller blood vessel branches that actually nourish the blood vessel wall itself. These are known as Vesa Vesoro. So that's our three layers of the general structure of a blood vessel wall. And I have next here a rather nice diagram illustrating these. And please note that the three layers that we have just talked about, tunica intima, media, and externa. The next thing that I would like to do is that we return to this slide that we saw earlier. And I would like for us to discuss in a little more detail each of these types of blood vessels and some subtypes of these. Let's start with arteries. When we talk about arteries, there are a few things that we need to look at. But let's start by reminding ourselves that these are the vessels that arise directly from the heart. So when the heart squeezes out blood, it leaves heart with a high pressure in a pulsatory manner. And the walls of these blood vessels, initial arteries, must be adapted to this. So if you think about it, the high pressure 
of blood being squeezed out from the heart must be tolerated by these vessels. And over the distance, before the blood reaches the capillaries, which, as we will learn soon, have a thin and not as strong walls, this high pressure with a pulse flow must be evened out. So those are some of the tasks that the arteries must be able to do. So how do we do this? Well, the arteries are typically much thicker and stronger in terms of their elastic and firm walls than what veins would be. And this can be seen in looking at the blood vessel in a catheter or in a microscopy as seen on this example. Notice how the artery has thicker and much firmer wall which retains its shape even when the blood has left the vessel. This is shown in this picture with green arrowheads. Veins instead shown with yellow arrowheads are much thinner in terms of their wall and they do not retain their shape as well when emptied from the blood. So that's a good demonstration of this. Now, let's return here and talk a little bit more about how different kinds of arteries can be classified. And this characterization is done based on the size, and by this I mean the thickness and function of the type of artery. And there are three for us to look at. Let's start with the elastic arteries. These are characterized by a thick wall and a lumen that facilitates a flow of the blood by having a low resistance to it. So these are very much our conducting arteries. A good example of this type of arteries would be our aorta and its first initial branches from the aortic arch. And when we look at the wall structure of these vessels, they are characterized by having a lot of elastin in the wall. And there is little to none vasoconstriction happening on these vessels. Instead, they expand and recoil in response to the pulsatile high pressure blood flowing out. So they can be considered as pressure reservoirs of the vasculature. So this is a good brief summary of the elastic arteries. Let's move on. Now we will look at the muscular arteries. Muscular arteries differ from the previous ones. Let's see how. So these are sometimes referred as our distributing arteries, where as elastic arteries were conducting, simply handling the pressure fluctuations and high pressure, these muscular arteries are different. Muscular arteries as being distributing arteries can do much more. They control where the blood is directed to and where not. And they do this through having a thick smooth muscle layer at the tunica media and there is little elastic tissue, so a big difference to the earlier one. And by having this muscular wall, they are able to do vasoconstriction, thus directing blood to or away from the other areas of the body. So they really are in charge of distributing where the blood goes to. As an interesting note, most of the arteries that we will look at are in fact these. So we will pay particular attention to this. And now, the last of the artery types that I want to talk about are actually arterioles. Let's see what they look like. So these are smaller in diameter of the lumen and thinner wall type of arteries. Eventually, there is just a single layer of tissue forming their wall. And we will see that they play an important role in forming capillary beds, controlling what flows in. And this is done through pre-capillary sphincters. Notice that these are those smooth muscle bands, looking kind of rings around where the capillaries branch off from the arterioles. And on this figure, we can see them all open, allowing much of blood 
to be directed to this particular capillary bed. And on this picture instead, we see the precapillary sphincter closed in many parts. This results in most of the blood from being prevented from flowing into this capillary bed in question. So that's what these precapillary sphincters do. So that was our arteries. Let's look at next capillaries in a little more detail. These are very small vessels, in fact so narrow in the diameter of the lumen that only about one red blood cell can squeeze through at one time. And another important thing to note is that the walls of these vessels are made of only tunica intima layer, so there is no media or externa in the capillaries. And there is a reason for this. The small diameter and a thin wall allow efficient exchange of materials from and to the blood. It is interesting to note that where in body can we find capillaries there? What do you think? Well, the answer is pretty much everywhere. We find these in nearly all parts of the body, with the exception of an eye and cartilage that I can think of. And their function is to allow gas, nutrient, waste product, hormone, and so on to be exchanged. So they are all about the passage of small, solid materials and fluids across the walls. And there are three different types of capillaries that I want to talk about with you. Let's have a look at these. So, here we have them. And we will start with Continuous capillaries. Continuous capillaries are found especially in the skin, muscles, lungs, and central nervous system. Their walls are solid without caps. So, continuous. Fenestrated capillaries instead have these small windows known as fenestrations. Their wall looks like Swiss cheese, if you wish. And they are especially important in organs that do filtration, absorption, or secretion. For example, kidneys, intestines, and hormone secretion. So small openings on the walls of this kind of capillary. And finally, sinusoidal capillaries. These are found typically in liver, bone marrow, spleen, and adrenal medulla, for example. They have huge gaps in their walls, much bigger than the fenestrations that we saw in the previous one. And by having these huge gaps in the walls of these capillaries, we are able to slow down the passage of the blood through them. And this in turn allows much more processing of the blood. So these structures with sinusoidal capillaries are often concerned with cleaning blood. So, that's it with our capillaries. And the next one that I want to talk about is our veins. Let's have a quick look at them. As you might remember, these carry blood to the heart. They have much thinner wall than arteries because there is such a low pressure in these vessels. And what is interesting, I think, is that these form the largest group of the blood vessels in terms of volume. So most of your blood at one time is located in the veins. So we have veins and venules, with the later being just a smaller version of the veins. And there is one adaptation that relates to the veins that I want to especially discuss about. And this concept has to do with venous return. Let's have a look at this a little more. So one important adaptation that we see here is that we have valves in the veins. And as you remember from our study of the heart, valves prevented the backflow of the blood. 
So because blood needs to return back to the heart, and sometimes against gravity for quite a long way, say for example if you are standing up from your feet to the heart, this is a hard task. And before you ask, no, it is not the heart that sucks the blood back in. Instead, it is the valves that allow the blood to return back to the heart. And this happens by skeletal muscles squeezing our veins every now and then. In fact, we move a little, the veins get squeezed. Remember, they had thin walls and were not that elastic. As a result of the blood, gets squashed up to the only direction that it can go as determined by the valves. So every time that we move, we are squeezing some more blood back to the direction of the heart. And it turns out that we move all the time. For example, our respiratory movements play a big role in this. And even when you sleep, you constantly move a little. So this is what allows the blood to return back to the heart against gravity. And what I would ask you to consider is that what happens when someone passes out, say after standing knees locked for a long time, standing totally still in a military parade? That is a good question, huh? And as a hint, it can be explained through this concept of Venus return and valves playing a role in the returning blood to the heart. And this brings me to a clinically relevant point that I want to highlight. What are varicose veins? Well, varicose veins, which are sometimes known here in the US as spider veins, I believe, are a result of incompetent valves. Now blood gets to pull up, and these show up as varicose veins. These result from issues with venous return and can also have a genetic component. Some risk factors include staying in one position for a long time, obesity, or even pregnancy. About 15% of adults here in the US are affected by this condition. Another cause that I mentioned here is the elevated blood pressure. For example, during childbirth or when one has constipation, there may be an increased intra-abdominal pressure, and as a result, there is varicose in anal veins. The resulting condition is called, of course, hemorrhoids. I think that we will finish this lecture here, and on our next video we will move toward the physiological aspects of the blood vessels. I look forward to seeing you then.